I love that um, I invited you and encouraged you to, to share what God put on your heart. And it all matched up so well with what I'm going to speak on, especially Richard uh, reading out John 14, because I'm quoting that today. It's almost like God's here. Um, God knows what he's doing. I just thank you for being open to him. And I, I hope that we can do that more often, because we're, we're a whole body. It's not just me standing here preaching. We, we get to build each other up and edify each other, and that's, that's so exciting. So, yeah, thank you guys for stepping out. Um, today we are continuing our series in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, if you didn't uh, uh, hear it last week, uh, I did an introduction and the first 17 verses, and I did them as two separate little talks, uh, and they are available on YouTube. So if you missed them, it gives a good bit of context, and the genealogy in those first 17 verses is so helpful in setting the, the scene and helping us understand our passage today. Am I all good for YouTube? <laughs> Hi, guys, online. So, um, last week I finished with just a little bit of application that said, based on that genealogy in Matthew, um, in Matthew chapter 1, that Jesus is the Messiah. He is who he says he is. That Jesus is the King and his kingdom has begun, his rule and reign on earth. And he came to save us. Such amazing truth that if we really fully take on board, it's life-changing. Um, and so we pick up today exactly where we left off. We finished at verse 17 last time, so we're on verse 18 this time. So if you can turn to Matthew chapter 1, if you've got a, a Bible or there's some on the tables, on verse 18. What I'm going to do is read the passage and I'm going to explain this passage verse by verse um, and I'm going to apply it as we go along because there's just so much gold in this passage. Oh, it's just brilliant. <laughs> oh dear. How am I going to fit it in half an hour? I don't know. Yeah. Father God, I just pray as we read your word, it would be your voice speaking. I pray for open hearts and open minds. I pray for transformation this morning that we would become a little more like Jesus through your word. Holy Spirit, that is something only you can do. So we, we ask that you do it this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, Matthew 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resisted her quietly. But as he considered these things, they do not fear to take Mary as your wife, which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Am I all right sound-wise, or shall I use the mic? <laughs> bit of a unsure. I will carry on. So here we have, right from the start, just like in our passage last week, Matthew just making it so clear, this is about Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ. And here, birth, the Greek word behind this is Genesis again, just like it was in verse 1, the genealogy, Genesis. This is a new beginning. And as we saw last week, this is how Jesus is coming in and saying, all that's gone before, I'm helping you to see. I fulfill it. I'm helping you to see the full understanding of it. And now everything comes through me. And we saw last week how Jesus is, is the word um, Yeshua, which means the Lord saves. And it comes from the name Joshua, which means the Lord is salvation. And although a common name, it's very fitting that this is Jesus' name. Matthew's making this really clear. He's Jesus, the Lord saves, Christ. And Christ, Christos, it means anointed one. It means king. 
the Jewish people straight away will be thinking, well, that's the one we've been waiting for, from the line of David, who was the anointed king, and all the promises that I mentioned last week that lead up to this king who would sit on the throne forever. And if you've got the NIV Bibles, a lot of these Bibles on the tables, it just says Messiah, because this anointed one that they've been expecting in the years, in the run-up to this, in the intertestamental times, um, they've been hoping for a Messiah that would be this anointed one to come and save and deliver them. So Matthew here is making it really clear. This is Jesus, the Lord saves, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And I have to pause here because this is so easy. You read this and it's Christmas and blah, 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 and you miss it. You think, hang on, this is the birth of the Son of God, the Messiah, who has always lived, and he is being born to a human woman. <laughs> And I marveled at this before Christmas when I preached on the manger and the mess, just the incredible thing that the almighty, holy, perfect God would come down into our mess. Here he is being born. And we, we know from John, it says, the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus is God. But the word took on human flesh and dwelt among us. Wow. And Hebrews 1 says that he's the exact radiance of of the glory of God, uh, the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. And here he is being born as a human, fully God and fully man. Just miraculous, amazing. And it took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Now I want to just focus on these two names and then I'm going to tell you what on earth betrothal means. So Matthew is very deliberate. We saw that last week in how he sets up his gospel, how he goes through it, patterns and names, and he's had that genealogy in there. Um, so names are important. And Mary was in that genealogy, which is unusual for the, for the women to be in the genealogies. And he's using Mary here. And he doesn't go into the detail that Luke does about Mary. But I think that Matthew is very interested in people's names and history. And I have become very interested in names and history by reading the background about this, because Mary, it, in the Greek, it is Maria. In the Hebrew, it's Miriam. And both of those names mean rebellion. I don't know what this means for Marie. <laughs> <laughs> rebellion. And you think, with God, nothing's an accident. Why has God chosen that the mother of Jesus would be called rebellion? And I... Actually, when you think about it, it's really interesting because the scene I set last week was we're in a, in a time 2,000 years ago where everything's become legalistic and about ritual and about regulation and tradition and stuff. The people are repressed by it, and Jesus comes into the world to rebel against that because that's not God's plan, to come against that status quo. And when you look at the Marys and the Miriams in the Bible, you see it all the way through. You think of Miriam in the Old Testament. I won't go into all the detail, but she was the one. When Moses is in the basket, Miriam's brother Moses, little baby, and the Pharaoh's daughter finds him. She's the one who has the guts and the kind of rebellious spirit against the oppressors who are killing all the babies to actually say to Pharaoh's daughter, I know a Hebrew woman who could nurse this baby, and goes and gets her mum. This is the, the woman who in Exodus, uh, what is it, 15, sings a triumphant song about the Egyptians drowning behind her in the Red Sea. Just such a kind of spirit of rebellion. Actually then going too far in Numbers 12 when she criticizes Moses and God gives her leprosy for a week. <laughs> but you see this rebellion in the Marys in the New Testament. You see it in um, Mary of Bethany, who's the sister of Martha and Lazarus. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus, which flies in the face of all of the kind of tradition and law at the time, that that's the place that only men should be. Or she's pouring expensive perfume on Jesus' feet and wiping it with her hair while Judas looks on, muttering. Or you think of Mary Magdalene. She was delivered from seven demons by Jesus and then gives her unwavering, radical support to him. She's there next to Jesus' mom at the foot of the cross in that open rebellion to what's happening. She's the first one to bring the gospel after meeting the resurrected Jesus. How amazing is that? So Mary, Miriam, 
Marie? <laughs> what a name. I love it. And you only have to, uh, well, you look at then Mary of Nazareth. She says yes to the angel in Luke 1. So she is in rebellion to all the assumptions, the oppression, the traditions, the regulations, the pride, the sexism, the legalism that is all around her. No wonder she's the mother of Jesus. <laughs> Good choice, I think. You only have to read her Magnificat, her song of praise in Luke 1 to see that. So that's Mary. And then you've got Joseph. Joseph, I looked up, the meaning of Joseph is let him add or increase or do again or could be taken as God shall add. So you, you have that genealogy at the start and then comes to Joseph, God shall add. You think, wow, there's such meaning in names. Joseph descended from David and Abraham, but I think it was Rob who pointed out, we were having breakfast the other week, and Rob was like, Jesus actually isn't descended from Joseph, is he? If Mary got pregnant without Joseph being involved, he's not actually biologically <laughs> descended from Joseph. So what is the point of that genealogy? But, and this, again, it's just God just being amazing, as always. He wasn't Joseph's biological son, but he was legally Joseph's son. This is about legal standing. So biologically, Mary's son and legally Joseph's son. And this just points to this incredible truth of how we are legally adopted into the family of God when we put our faith in Jesus. And I think, well, okay, so what do we, what do we get from that? It's really good that they've got meaningful names. But I want to encourage you this morning, every single one of you, that God knows your name. He knows your name. Out of the billions and billions of people who have ever lived, he knows your name. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He cares about you. He has plans for your life. Isaiah 43, he says to his people, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And the good shepherd, in John chapter 10, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So just as God knows Mary's name, Joseph's name, and they have meaning, he knows your name. Wow. <laughs> so these two, Mary and Joseph, are betrothed. What does that mean? It can be a bit confusing, thinking, are they married? Joseph's thinking about divorcing her, but are they actually married? And to really understand this, you've got to understand the kind of ancient Jewish marriage procedure. And I've been doing a lot of reading on this, and I could speak on this for days now. It's just <laughs> the layers of meaning that you then see uh, transferred then onto Jesus and the church, the church being the bride of Christ, is fantastic. So you had kind of two or three different uh, stages of, of the Jewish kind of marriage tradition, where to start with, you'd have like a, a mutual agreement, normally made by the parents or a matchmaker for two young guys under 18. By guys, I mean male and female. Um, and you could, the, the lady could still break it off at that point. You do see that sometimes in the Old Testament. It's not a legally binding thing yet. And then at some point, these two people, they get um, kind of separately immersed in water so that there's like a symbolic cleansing before the betrothal. And I'm starting to think, oh, that sounds a little bit bi like baptism. And then you get the betrothal. So this is basically where, where the engagement is fully confirmed. They're betrothed to each other. This is where Joseph and Mary are at. Um, and this is legally binding. They actually come together for a ceremony underneath a kind of tent called the huppah, which uh, is like a, a marriage canopy that's symbolic of this new household that's starting. And again, I think, oh yeah, we're invited into the new household of, of Christ when we're saved. Hmm, interesting. Um, the groom then uh, gives like a valuable object, such as a ring to the, to the bride. And a cup of wine is shared to seal the covenant vows. Hmm, a cup of wine, interesting. Um, and then this betrothal period lasts a, around a year, roughly. Um, and during that time, the bride prepares. So she's getting her wedding garments ready, her lamp ready and stuff. And the groom goes to prepare a place for her. 
Now, Richard Smith read that out in John 14 earlier. And he's going to come back at some point in roughly a year's time, but the bride doesn't know the day or the hour. Is that familiar? We don't know when Jesus is going to come back. But as Richard read out earlier, he, he's gone to prepare a place for us, and then he's going to come back and take us to where he's at. And so this betrothal and marriage really represents that. And so the bride would have to stay ready, have her oil lamps ready in case he came in the night. And he would come in great procession with all kind of joy and uh, lots of noise and fanfare. And there would be a bridal procession and the sounding of the shofar, the ram's horn, that's Rosie's ringtone. I should have cued you up to do that, Rosie. Um, And so then they are back under the chuppah again and they have this marriage ceremony where they fully are now husband and wife and have all the rights of husband and wife and sexual relations, can consummate the marriage and live together. But Mary and Joseph are at this betrothal stage where for them to separate would require a proper divorce and only the man could do that. And that's why Joseph is considering it. And again, let's pause and just apply this. I mean, there's just so much in there. I haven't got time to go into that, but you've seen some little parallels. But the big one is that we, the church, are betrothed to Jesus. We are in that betrothal stage. And we are invited to the wedding feast when Jesus returns. We don't know when he's coming back. But he says in John 14, in my house there are many rooms. And I go to prepare a place for you. I may come back and take you to where I am. Where does he go? He went to the cross. He died, he rose and ascended, and he's going to come back and take us there. And it says in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only way into that house, to that wedding feast, is through Jesus. So the question is, do you know Jesus? He is the only way. And if you do know him, our life is about being ready he want, when he comes back, we should be f- in full service mode, glorifying him and obeying him and taking the gospel of the kingdom out there. That's the equivalent of having our lamps ready for when he comes back. And so it says here that Mary is pregnant. So if she's got pregnant in the betrothal stage and that's when they shouldn't have a, had any sexual relations at all, now we've got a problem. And all of the law at the time, whether it's Jewish law, Greek law or Roman law, demands that Joseph publicly divorces her. And so there'd be great shame on her name and her family. But he's an honorable man. He resolves to do it quietly. Good on Joseph. (laughs) He wants to do it discreetly to minimize the scandal, to try and protect her reputation. I love here that Joseph realizes that grace and mercy are more important than strict adherence to the law. And we saw that last week when uh, I was just giving some background on how Jesus called Matthew. And the Pharisees are like, whoa, you're associating with sinners and tax collectors. And Jesus says, I prefer mercy over sacrifice. Joseph gets it. So he's going to do a good thing. But then we get verse 20. As he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream And for the Jewish people reading this, they're like, well, yeah, that is how God often operates. It's happened a lot through the Old Testament. And he says, Joseph, son of David, really affirming that identity again, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And this is now the second time that the Holy Spirit has been mentioned in this passage. And that's no accident. This is Matthew really drawing our attention to the third member of the Trinity, which has really seen Father God. This is all about Jesus and his birth. But here is the Holy Spirit. And Joseph at the time would not have had our full understanding of the Holy Spirit because he hasn't got the New Testament. So all of Joseph's understanding of this and Mary's understanding would be based on the Old Testament. So what did they know about the Holy Spirit from then? There was a good commentary that I read by William Barclay that, that listed out some of the main things that they would have known. So one of them is... Through the Old Testament, you can see that it was the Holy Spirit who was the one who brought truth to God's people, normally through the prophets, brought truth about who God is and who his people are. And so by really emphasizing that the Holy Spirit is involved 
in this birth, in this conception, he's saying that Jesus would be the one bringing God's truth. Truth about who God is, truth about who we are. And so really kind of emphasizing, okay, this is going to be a bringer of truth. Also from the Old Testament, you see that Holy Spirit not only brings truth, but enables people to actually see truth and understand truth. He opens people's eyes, people who are blinded by ignorance or prejudices or sins or passions. And therefore, Jesus would be the one to open eyes to the truth. You'd also see in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit is very much linked to creation. You see in Genesis 1, in the beginning, in verse 2, it says the Holy Spirit was hovering over the surface of the deep. And you've got this kind of electric anticipation and excitement. And elsewhere in the Old Testament, you see these links to creation. So Psalm 33, it says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of the Lord all their host. And breath and spirit are the same in both the Hebrew and the Greek. You see it in Psalm 104, verse 30. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. Job 33, verse 4, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So just as the Holy Spirit was involved in creation, so this Jesus would be uh, involved in creating and giving life, would be God's life-giving, creating power coming into the earth. And also they'd see a link to recreation. In Ezekiel, you have that famous passage of the dry bones being brought to life. And so there would be this sense of Jesus would be the one to bring to life the soul that's dead in sin. We're all born dead in sin. And yet because of this prominence of the Holy Spirit in this account in Matthew, we're seeing this Jesus is going to bring life where there has been death. And I was just kind of reading through as well. You can see the Holy Spirit rushing on King David when he became king. Uh, The passage we read last week in Isaiah chapter 11, you saw the Spirit resting upon this son of David who was to come in the future. So Matthew is basically drawing our attention to the Holy Spirit role. He's saying that in the birth of Jesus, the Holy Spirit was more at work than in anyone else ever. So therefore, he would bring God's truth of who he is and who we ought to be. He would bring, um, well, he'd open our eyes to see that truth, and he'd bring life and power to dead souls. And that's, that's all in there, just from him mentioning the Holy Spirit. I love that there's a, there's a trinity aspect, that you've got God the Father being revealed by the Son, and someone brought that uh, this morning during our worship time, And it's through the power and agency of the Holy Spirit. You've got Father God sending Jesus, who then sends the Holy Spirit to us and sends us out. Love it. And Matthew's audience in 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, in the first century, whenever it was, would know this. They would be seeing the Holy Spirit at work in gifts of the Spirit in the apostles. And they would see, right, so this Holy Spirit is the one who is part of the conception and is then the one who raises Jesus and therefore is the one in me. And he's being manifested through these gifts and through the boldness in preaching and is the the power through which people are being saved. And so we today have this same Holy Spirit. So may we walk by the Spirit, not by our own strength and wisdom, through his power. He's been given that we may go that great commission at the end of Matthew, and bring the gospel of the kingdom, bring truth, bring life into our world. So the challenge there is, is is that happening? If we've got that same Holy Spirit in us, and we're in our house, in our workplace, we're socializing, we're in Tesco, wherever we are, is that truth and that life and that power in us impacting our thinking and our speaking? Is it impacting the people around us? So verse 21, through the angel in the dream, God says, Mary will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And you'll call him Jesus, because it means the Lord saves, the Lord is salvation. And he will save his people from their sins. And again, this is fascinating, just looking into this. 
sins, you may think, well, that's the bad things I do, isn't it? And that's such a trap we fall into, and I think that's something the devil loves us to, to think. Yeah, it's just bad things we do, bad deeds. Because what that means is that people who feel that they're good and they lead, they lead good lives and, uh, you know, they don't be horrible to people and they give to charity and blah, blah, blah. They think, well, I'm not a sinner. I don't do that bad things. And then you feel like there's a level. There's Hitler, who's down there, and then there's me here, and then there's, uh, you know, whoever you think is amazing up here. But it's not the case. Sin is, is everywhere. I looked at um, the Greek word that's used here for sin. It's hamartia. And that actually means to not have a share in something or to miss the mark or to violate God's law. So sin is basically what we're born into, that all of us violate God's law. What's God's law summarized as? To love God with all our heart, our mind, soul, our strength, and to love others as ourselves. And we're not doing that all the time, and the world's not doing that all the time. So however good someone is, if they're not loving God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, they're sinning. If they're not loving others as themselves, they're sinning. So we're in a pretty desperate state. And it's fascinating that all those things that I describe the Holy Spirit as doing in the Old Testament, sin does the opposite of. Sin causes us to suppress truth and live in shame and hide things. Sin causes us to become blind to truth of who we are and who God is. Sin causes us to spoil and destroy God's creation and each other. Sin causes us to be dead spiritually. It's all of the opposite of what the Holy Spirit does. And yet it says Jesus comes to save us from all of that. Save us. Not just kind of pull us out and and leave us, but save here is the word sozo, and it means to completely, wholly heal and completely save. And he's going to completely save his people from all of that lawlessness, violating God's law, being missing the mark completely. What an amazing thing. And the people will, will have been keen on this. Psalm 130, maybe you turn to this one. I'll give you a couple of examples in the Old Testament. People like Joseph, like Mary or people reading Matthew's gospel for the first time in the first century, they will have been waiting, waiting for this one who will come and redeem them. Psalm 130, you hear, hear this anguish. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. O oh Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O oh Lord, should mark iniquities, O oh Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. So they've been expecting. This is, this is a promise of God. Someone's coming who's going to do this, and it's Jesus, the one who's going to come and save his people from his sins. Or turn a bit further on to Isaiah 53. Famous passage. He was pierced for our transgressions. Isaiah 53, verse 3. It says of this person who is going to come. This was written seven or eight hundred years before Jesus came. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And here I was looking up the words again in the Hebrew. Transgression, I won't try and pronounce it, but it means to break relationship. It means betrayal. And iniquity, we saw in both those passages, it means something bent out of shape, made crooked. So how can it possibly then be kind of straight and good again? So it's more than just bad deeds. It's a break in relationship. It's something that's and broken. And it's saying, he's going to come and save us. He's going to have all of that 
brokenness laid on him. And so Matthew has given us the sense of that already, just in this simple sentence. You shall call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. Amazing. And they would have been expecting maybe a big prophet to come, uh, speaking the words of God, or maybe a priest who could somehow make atonement for their sins, or uh, this mighty king who, who would kind of vanquish their enemy and set them free. And yet in Jesus, you find all three of those things. The ultimate prophet, priest, and king. PPK. I don't know if you remember the Hebrew series, but I love that bit. The ultimate prophet, priest, king. The one who, full of the Holy Spirit, would say the words of God. And we're going to see that through Matthew in all these amazing discourses. The ultimate priest who would put himself in our position, who would go to the cross and make atonement for us and would send us then out to represent him. The ultimate king who has inaugurated his kingdom, his rule and reign. You got all that from that one sentence. And it means that our sins are forgiven if we have come to Jesus and put our faith in him and have become a true disciple, a follower of Jesus. Our sins, our brokenness, our complete violation and lawlessness has been sorted. That's incredible. Thank you, God. I'm saved by grace through faith. When I stood at that airing cupboard door 10 years ago and God said, I love you, it was when I was at my lowest, at my least deserving, at my most rubbish. Hadn't spoken to him or acknowledged him for three years. And yet his amazing grace just poured out he says I love you he saved me from my sin (laughs) and whether yours was dramatic or over a long period of time or whatever if you're a disciple of Jesus he saved you from your sin and if you don't know him you have the opportunity to he's calling and while we're looking back at Matthew actually references the Old Testament Isaiah 7 here he says in verse 22 all this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. And he quotes Isaiah 7, 14. He says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So if I turn over to Isaiah 7 and read that verse, verse 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel which means God with us. Now, again, I could go on for days about this because it's really interesting, but I'm going to have to summarize it. Um, seven or 800 years ago, before Jesus, there was a king called Ahaz. There were people about to attack the kingdom, Judah, and um, God says, I'm with you. I'm going to deliver you and I'll give you a sign. And Ahaz says, no thanks. <laughs> and God says, because he's not a good king, this Ahaz. And you may have seen his name in the genealogy. Um, so God says, no, I'm still going to give you a sign. That in the time it takes for a boy to be born and weaned, I could deliver you from your enemies. As proof that God is with you. And it's fascinating, reading Isaiah chapter 7 and 8. You see all this kind of imagery. Uh, It talks about he shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. So he's saying by the time that boy, if there's a real boy called Emmanuel born, not quite sure, but he's saying in the time it would take for him to be born and to be kind of weaned, your enemies will be gone and you'll be all right, if you trust in me. Ahaz doesn't, (laughs) and so it doesn't go very well. And then gradually leading to, to the destruction, the exile into Babylon. And so that prophecy is left hanging. That God would be with his people. And so here you are back in Matthew. And Matthew is saying, the time is now. God is here with his people. This is the Emmanuel that you've been waiting for for hundreds of years. He's with you. And you think, well... Okay, it says to call him Emmanuel, but it also says to call him Jesus, and then they always call him Jesus. They never seem to call him Emmanuel. And it's because Emmanuel is kind of more of a title, like Christ, anointed one, Emmanuel, God with us, because 
it's not just a name, it's so much more. It's the truth of who he is. He's God with us. He's there on earth. He has pitched his tent, made a dwelling place on earth to be with his people. And that continues now. As I said, the Father sent the Son. The Son gave us the Holy Spirit. And so he is with us now all the time. And he will come back for us. He's gone to prepare a place for us and he's coming back for his beautiful bride, the church, and will then be with us for eternity. Hallelujah. So, I've got two more verses left. And this is where I love how it draws it to a close. Because I've been reading recently about, we've made the gospel too much about just salvation. That the end goal is just to get saved. But no, that's the start. You get saved, so then you can follow Jesus and start to reign in life and bring the gospel of the kingdom. And that requires obedience. That requires trust. And that's exactly what happens at the end here. Verse 24. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not, so he didn't consummate the marriage, until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. He did as God commanded him. So if we know Jesus, if we're saved, it's the start of an adventure of us gradually becoming more and more like Jesus in surrender to that Holy Spirit, that creating force in us, that power, that life, that truth, to become more and more like Jesus. So in faith now, we can go and do what God says, which ultimately is love God with all our heart, with all our soul, our mind, our strength, our whole being, and love others, love our neighbor as ourself. And it may be countercultural. Joseph had to now go and not divorce Mary. <laughs> what we have to do to live for Jesus may well go against the world, and there's a cost to it. But take courage because of Emmanuel, God with us. He has gone before. He is behind us, with us, in us, through us, God with us. So, my final slide that I had on the screen, those words of application that I've said throughout, that's truth for us now. He knows your name. He cares about you. Don't let the devil lie to you and whisper anything else. When you're in those dark nights and you're thinking, he doesn't care about me, he hasn't answered that prayer, or I'm rubbish, I'm not deserving it, he knows my name. He loves me. We are his betrothed, the church. This is a beautiful, glorious gathering of his people, a community of believers, not a building, a people being prepared for that wedding feast. He has dealt with everything that stands in the way of that. If we have put our faith in Jesus, all of the crookedness, the things that are bent out of shape, the lawlessness, the violation of the law, the missing the mark, it's all been dealt with. And he is with us. And if you just dwell on that, that should be enough to get you through this week, I think. <laughs> and more. So let's go and be disciples here. Let's trust and obey like Joseph did and seek his kingdom first. Amen. Amen. Cool. Right, that's where we'll say goodbye to YouTube.